We have a few special guests who I would like to acknowledge here tonight. Um, Russell Lord from the American Federation of Arts who organized this stunning traveling exhibition. Um, Bridget Moore from New York's DC Moore Gallery that has represented Whitfield Lavelle for very many years. And the distinguished artist, Fred Wilson. Um, yes. <laughs> Last but not least, my esteemed colleagues who are in the back of the, um, this auditorium, our makeshift lecture hall, Haley Perkins and DeMarco Payton, deserve recognition for their expert orchestration of this program tonight. <laughs> so at last, I am deeply honored to introduce you to Whitfield Lavelle, who is with us tonight from New York City. Um, my first encounter with Whitfield's work was in an exhibition I oversaw here at the museum, which a few of you may remember from 2004, which I can't believe was 20 years ago. Um, African American Masters highlights from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And even then, I was a little late to the party, as Mr. Lavelle had been working for, um, to acclaim for many years by that time. The large piece from the Smithsonian was called Echo One, of 1996, he's imagining it in his, in his head, um, a ghostly frontal image of a woman with a rather flat affect and wearing a flouncy dress. Um, her portrait, which was 80 inches tall and drawn in charcoal on old wood paneling with remnants of gray-green paint, moved me and I was hooked. Two years ago, when our director Cameron Kitchen, who had worked with Whitfield previously on several projects, embraced the opportunity to present this exhibition, I volunteered to take it on, and I've been privileged to get to know the artist and his remarkable work in depth. The honoree of a MacArthur Genius, as they call it, fellowship for his contributions to art, Whitfield Lavelle is justly celebrated for immersive and evocative installations such as that you see upstairs. So please join me in welcoming Whitfield Lavelle to Cincinnati, and it is his first visit. <laughs> So I please ask um, that you, um, as a matter of housekeeping, silence your cell phones if you have not yet remembered to do that. Um, after Whitfield and I chat for a while, I will open to the floor to all your burning questions. So if you would just hold them, that would be wonderful. Um, and I'm going to jump right in um, to my questions, of which I have too many, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so my first question is about drawing. And drawing is central to your practice, not for studies as is traditional, but as an essential art with autonomy equal to painting. And why not painting? What is it about drawing, and what does it mean to you? OK. Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. I started out, like most humans do, drawing, making marks, scratchings. Uh, you know, when, you, when, when a child first makes a mark on a piece of paper, they realize that they can somehow affect the world by doing something. And I learned, probably when I was about two years old, that with crayons, you know, you could scribble on things. And so I scribbled all over the walls <laughs> in, 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 our, in our home. And, <clears throat> you know, the, I always thank my parents because they purposely did not chastise me. They just acted like it was nothing. And my grandmother came over and w washed the walls down with soap and water. <laughs> <laughs> but my, 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 my parents did go out and buy me a big sketch pad after that. And they taught me, you know, the how nice it was to make these drawings on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now, moving, moving along from those years, um, I drew all the time. Every school year, 
I was somehow established as like the artist in the class. And um, I had other interests such as, you know, music and writing. Uh, but <clears throat> I was very involved in drawing. And, the, and, and, and but the more I did it, the better the drawings got. Uh, so it was time to apply for high school. I went to the High School of Music and Art, which is the LaGuardia School that they memorialized in the movie Fame. And uh, that was a really incredible time for me because we got to have three periods of art per day and things like sensitivity and being different were valued as opposed to, you know, in the Bronx where they weren't. <laughs> 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 so I loved going to school every day. And <clears throat> now, in making the shift to painting, from painting to, uh, to making marks with like dry media and doing more drawings, that <laughs> occurred, um, I'd say, in my early 20s, right after college. I had been painting, I, you know, I studied painting, sculpture, you know, the works. I did ceramic and ceramics and such. But my heart was into painting and I loved art history. And when my, my, my parents sent me to Spain as a graduation gift and I, I fell in love with the works of Vasquez, uh, El Greco, and you know, some of, some of those other Spanish painters. And that's when I decided I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to be a fine artist as opposed to a commercial artist or something else in that realm. Uh, so I studied painting very rigorously. I got involved in realism, almost to the point of super realism, which I, I practiced a lot. And my, <clears throat> my relatives who were a little less vain and more loving would sit for me, like they'd actually sit for me. I'd tell them, don't dress up, just come in what you wore last week, and I want you to sit the way you did last week. And they did it. And I told them, I'm not going to flatter you, I'm just going to paint you as I see you. So I did a lot of these works, which uh, that was my realist uh, oil painting period. And um, then it, 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 it came to a point where events in my life led me to uh, feel that I needed to make a statement with my work and not uh, be so involved in the technique of pushing paint around, uh, you know, and then mixing colors and everything. I love that. I love the smell of turpentine and <laughs> linseed oil, but I felt that with uh, um, uh, pastel and charcoal, I could make markings quickly. And I could 
get to the core of my feelings quickly. See, that's something that they can't teach you in art school. They can't tell you how to come in terms with your feelings and how to deal with your life experiences. They can't teach you that, and, and they don't. Uh, so I stopped painting, not consciously, I just took a break, and I started working on uh, pastel, big pastel pieces. And after a while, it was, you know, starting, you know, the, the more you do it, the better it gets. And it just, I just started getting into the flow of it. And I didn't feel like painting anymore. I admire paintings, but I just felt like, you know, the history of painting is so loaded. I mean, we have all the great masters and we have thousands of painters today and everyone's trying to come up with a unique way of painting so that their work will stand out and, and look and feel uh, unique. And um, I mean, it's daunting. It, I found it daunting in my early 20s. I was like, well, do I like, do I work loosely? Do I keep the brush strokes or do I, you know, paint smoothly or do I, you know, what about color and, you know, but the act of working with the immediate marks, and then being able to take the eraser, change the marks, use other materials and make marks. That was something that I, I think I consider more, um, I, 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 I developed more of a, 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 a personal language with with, uh, with those mediums. The um, pieces that you'll see in the prologue series were done, uh, well, they're, 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 they're like, you know, 50 or 60 of them, but we, we have a few in the show and they were done with oil stick and charcoal on paper. And that became my technique and that became like what people thought of when they thought of my work. You know, people could recognize it. And it, you know, it, it's, it, it's tricky when you're a young artist and you want to learn how to make your own statement it's tricky, you don't want to be um, derivative, but you have your heroes and people who came before you, who, uh, who, who feed your, your work and, uh, and, and encourage you. And so that is one, the, the, that, that, prologue series is uh, a good example of where I took the works on paper with dry medium. And <clears throat> then I went to uh, Texas, spent a year in Texas, and I got an up opportunity to do something that I had always wanted to do, which was uh, installation. Because not only do I love to draw, but I love to collect things. Uh, I got that from my grandmother. She taught me how to bargain <laughs> at flea markets. <laughs> and so just objects and having them and collecting 
collecting, you know? Like if you have fun, if you find a little car that you like, and that's, you know, might be a nice car, but then if you've got 20 of them, that's a collection. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> I have many collections. So um, then it, it was a really natural thing for me to begin to incorporate it, to incorporate the found objects with the two-dimensional drawings. But it was that experience in Texas that gave me the push to go ahead and do it, you know, because I had to deal with space. And I love making installation work. Because I feel like in an installation, I'm, I'm, I'm painting with color. Sorry, not color. I'm painting with light. I'm painting with space. Um, and I'm creating an environment, a mood that hopefully somehow uh, uh, brings the viewer to another place and uh, transports the viewer to another place. Probably some place that I remember from long ago. So um, I have not used any oil paint since I was about 21. That doesn't mean that I won't. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what, you know, you, as long as you're open, you never know what your next step will be. <laughs> so you've, you've preempted some of my questions, which is not Did surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Um, so, um, what draws you to the kinds of objects that you collect and incorporate into your work, and what is your creative process in developing tab the tableau that have intersections, or the or the kin series, or any of those that um, pair um, drawn pieces with three dimensional objects? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, <laughs> when I started working with installation, and that was in Texas, where they had a lot of space and there were a lot of just opportunities and people wanted me to do drawings on their walls and play around. And, and uh, so I, I, I got back to New York I had a teaching job from the time I was 27 until I was 41. And so uh, I had to balance the, the job with the love for art, for making art. I wanted to be making art all the time, uh, full time. And I also, had to come to terms with my collecting slash hoarding. <laughs> um, so I, I remember when I was oh, 20s, late, late 20s, I went to Mexico and I said, well, I said, After I got back from Mexico, I said, from now on, I'm only gonna buy things for my art. I'm not gonna buy anything else for the house. <laughs> because, you know, you have all these chachkas and things that have meaning, but no, you know, you, 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 you I have so much that you can't see anything. So, <laughs> um, I, I kept that 
promise to myself until a couple of years later I went to Bali and I let that you know promise I was like bought up all of Bali and, <laughs> and also in Egypt I bought up all of Egypt <laughs> so <laughs> when I go to to new places I I I still accumulate and um <clears throat> but I have to be always thinking about what I can do with ordinary objects. And those are the things that I find in antique stores and flea markets, sometimes on the street, sometimes in someone's house. I'll find something that they're discarding and I'll ask if I can, if I can uh, use it. And uh, <clears throat> so with the tableau pieces, I guess there are, what, what we have basically is we have an image that is drawn and it is drawn from a found photograph. I rarely, almost never do artworks of family members or people that I know. I also almost never do images of famous people. Uh, I, I, I do images of people that I don't know. That you know, probably no one knows who they are because they don't have names attached to them. They're just these images that were left behind as evidence <clears throat> that they were once here. And I find that fascinating in and of itself. The beauty in those faces and the, the souls that these were people who once walked the earth and somehow contributed, somehow uh, kept this world spinning. And I like the idea of sort of giving them uh, a way of living on, sort of. Uh, <clears throat> so there are three ways that the tableaus can can come about. One is that I will have a photograph that is so incredible that I want to work with it. And then I'll go and I'll find the right wood panels to put that image on. And then I'll find the right objects to incorporate. The other way it can happen is that I'll find an object like a ruler or a gardening tool that has, you know, something about the, the, the wear and tear, the daily rituals of using this utensil sort of it, it, it's sort of imbued with whoever touched it. And so I will become fascinated with this object and I'll say, I've got to use this in, a, in, in an artwork. And so <clears throat> from the object, I have to find an image and a wood panel that I can use and then all three elements meld together. Very, on, on very rare occasions do I start out with all three components, meaning uh, I'll say, I want to do a man sitting in a chair with lots of ropes and I want the wood to be purple. 
you know, that, that's, that's rare. But sometimes it happens, you know. And, but, 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 but it always changes as, as you go about. So you were talking to me and our print curator, Kristen Spangenberg, today about wood, and you got me thinking. Um, you know, wood is clearly a, a favorite material for you. Um, what makes wood so alluring to you? Uh, well, it comes from trees, comes from nature. My, my southern grandparents had mostly wooden furniture that they uh, that they brought some well, some which they brought from South Carolina when they moved north, but that was their aesthetic was wooden, well carved, well made wooden furniture. I even remember wearing brown, choosing brown shoes and brown clothing because you know my parent my grandparents turned me on to brown you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so i i started i started in texas making those images on the on the wood with charcoal which is burnt wood, that's exactly what it is. And so you're returning this uh, other form of wood back. And I smudge the, the charcoal in with my fingers and I use erasers to pull out the highlights. So, you know, like I'll have a, a, a charcoal stick between these fingers, I'll have an eraser here, and I'll have a blending stump here. And, you know, the blending stump helps to uh, blend the, the charcoal when my fingers are tired of rubbing on the wood. And so, so that's my process, and I just absolutely love it. I love the feel of the wood. I, I, I love that, the idea of the, the, the circular thing that happens when wood returns to wood and um, um, that's pretty much. I, I, and I, I will also say that I remember not being very uh, in love with the tooth of canvas, mm -hmm. you know? And so I love working on wood and I love finding, uh, finding the objects. I can find objects that look like nothing to people and put it in a place of honor, like with those kin drawings, you know. Now with that series, I found the first, you know, the first kin piece I did is the one on the banner outside the museum. It's a very young boy with a hat and there's like a garland of flags. Um, now, how did I get into that? I, I, I found a small photograph of this little boy and the emotion in his eyes and something about the dark, rich tones of his face. Just the whole picture was something that I felt I wanted to, uh, to, to capture. And I worked on it, and I worked on it until, and I, I never stop until I feel I've captured something of that person's soul based on what 
I'm reading from the photograph. And uh, then I, I always have this, um, this, this urge to then add objects that will take the piece to another level and give you, give the viewer, give myself, and give the, the, the image in the drawing a uh, deeper meaning and, and connotations. Sometimes they're very abstract and sometimes they're uh, meanings that can be read in a more obvious way. Uh, I, I try to walk a fine line because I don't want to be overly obvious and I don't want, uh, I don't want the, um, I don't want to have only one way of looking at a piece. I want the viewer to come with some of their own vision, their eyesight, and see what they see in it. Uh, people, sometimes people ask me, well, does this, does this uh, train set represent, and I can't always explain what it represents. But sometimes it's easier to explain. Uh, the, the, the one with the, the woman, the profile of the woman, and then there's this train set around, train set, and the cars are going like, like so. I, I, I call that one evolution, right? No. Revolution. Revolution. Did I say it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good. Revolution. Thank you so much. I knew when it came out, I knew it didn't sound right. But, I mean, if you think about that, you think about this woman, you look at her, and then you think of what symbolically the piece is saying with these trains in, in which you're supposed to imagine that the trains are in motion, right? And when we put a title on it, like... Revolution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that, you know, you can read some really interesting uh, things and connect those ideas with historical facts. And um, that's, that's, how, that's how the tableau pieces come about. So um, speaking of titles, a lot of your titles have references to music. Mm -hmm. And you include music and sound and sheet music in your installations. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly these titles are important to you, and what do you see as the connections between music and the visual aspects of your work? I started out um, singing, oh, I guess, mm, from the time I was four, maybe five, I sang, uh, in choirs and and seriously, and I my parents sent me to vocal to vocal coach, and as I said, you know I, I couldn't go to the high school of music and art for both music and art. I had to make a choice. So I'm an avid music person. I love jazz. I love folk music. I love opera. I like show tunes, Broadway. I like 
what's called world music, you know, like South American, uh, uh, Mexican music, African music. I, I love it all. And <clears throat> one of the things, since you asked me in this case about the titles, one of the things I really dislike is when a title is blunt and obvious and it tells the viewer exactly what to see rather than giving you the opportunity to look at it and see something through your lens. So a lot of times my, my, uh, my titles are perhaps more poetic than literal. Um, and since, you know, I, 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 I know like almost every song from, you know, Cole Porter uh, to um, Wagner, sometimes I'll just, uh, you know, rather than come up with the obvious title, I will use something like a line from a poem, you know, and I start from a poem, from a song. I might use a line from a, from a, a, a an opera, a line from a poem, as I said, and sometimes like in watching films, or just listening to television, I will hear an expression that just grabs me. There was a, there was a, a couple trying to buy a house in south of France on House Hunters. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, when they found their house, the woman said that this is what I've always wanted. This is my cri de coeur. And I was like, how <laughs> beautiful is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I used that as a title. And uh, so I have like books where I write down titles that I think are really, really beautiful. And sometimes they work. Sometimes the pieces themselves call for their own titles when, uh, when, they're, when they're done. Now, <clears throat> like I was, uh, like, like um, Julia was saying, um, a lot of, there are a lot of song titles and song lyrics that I have used, particularly in the Kin series. Uh, there was, and, and you know, being, being that I, 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 I never listened to prop, uh, popular music, I always thought these songs that I knew were you know, people that myself and older people might know, but there was one, which I think it was in Arlen, Arlen, Arlen. It was an in Arlen tune. And part of the lyric was, cross the river, round the bend, okay? Nice, that, you know, it did, and, and, and you know, I, I, I like that because there was a rope that was twisted and it was, you know, it was twisted like this and then there was this, this woman with these twisted braids in her hair and I just thought it, it, it was a fitting title. I didn't, I didn't expect this one museum to take all of my titles 
and typed them into the computer so they knew each song that I had used lyrics from. And, you know, I, they, they wanted to have listening stations with Lena Horne singing this song, Cross the River Round the Bend, Howdy Stranger, So Long Friend, you know? And I was like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> When I when I um, when I want to have the actual music, the music and the lyric be heard, be present, I will play it. Mm -hmm. You know, like in the the telephone. I I I really wanted that version of that lift every voice to be uh, heard, but I wanted you to hear it, not just loud, I wanted you to hear it um, alone, with the telephone to your ear. And I felt that that song helped, it related to all of those pieces that I was doing in the Red series. Uh, and then, you know, when I did the, um, the parlor in the Richmond project, uh, I went through like three compilation albums of gospel tunes to find the right one to play on the radio. And it, it, it had to be the right one. And you know, sometimes those gospel songs, people shout and they sing high notes and they, you know, clap and everything. But this one is just so, like, mellow and it's also got so much feeling in it. So I chose that to play in that room. And the deep river, do you want me to? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when I, when I uh, went to Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Hunter Museum, which is where I created that installation, um, I, I needed, uh, when I make installations, let me just say, when I, when, I, when I get an opportunity to make an installation, it's a wonderful gift. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to do something that I can't do in my studio, right? I've got space and I can just let my ideas flow and I can try things that are a bit unusual, you know? Uh, so, uh, I, I, I like to go to the venue and learn about the city and just different things about the city that inspire me. That's how I created the Richmond Project and the, um, the Dismal Swamp Project at the Virginia... Contemporary Art Center. And so I get this opportunity to go to Chattanooga and I'm really excited about going. And when I got there, I was like, okay, so, you know, any historical information on, you know, Chattanooga that you'd like to share with me? So in terms of me being black, I figured they wanted something that had to do with the black community. And the materials they gave me were very scarce. They had, well, they told me that Bessie Smith was born there in Chattanooga. And she sang in the speakeasies in this one district in Chattanooga. Her birthplace 
is now a parking lot. And the speakeasies, like, like blocks of them, have been torn down, long been torn down. And they're replaced with you know, nice eateries and boutiques and things like that. So, so that kind of the, the, the physical remnants of that was erased. Uh, but still, you know, Bessie Smith was a little too easy for me, you know? Because I, I love Bessie Smith, but I didn't want to do an installation on her. So I go, I, I, I was taken all over, taken to the, um, this neighborhood, that neighborhood, and this gentleman named, his name was Mr. White. He was an African-American man who was a scholar in uh, Chattanooga history. He took me on the tram ride to the highest point in Chattanooga, and he pointed to a bunch of high-rise buildings, and he said, that's where the black community used to be. <laughs> and so, like, well, you know, and, and then I asked him, are, are there any soul food places here? And he's like, nope, not a one. <laughs> so I'm just thinking, you know, what am I gonna do here? <laughs> so, so then I went, I went to the, um, the Chattanooga Historical Society. The director's name, he was a white man named Mr. Black. <laughs> 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 and he told me, well, you know, his, his, his office window was right on the Tennessee River. And he said, you see that spot over there? That's where the Trail of Tears was, you know. There was a, a monument on the, okay, and then over there was where Camp Contraband was. And I said, what's Camp Contraband? So he told me that that was a Union campground where any runaway slaves who wanted to uh, get asylum to be protected from being recaptured. You know, anyone below that, that uh, area south of the Tennessee River, like you, if you were just black, you could be kidnapped and sold off into slavery. Didn't matter which plantation you came from, you just, you know, you just, you just, you would just, commodity. So <clears throat> I, I, I learned that people who were running away from slavery, if they could make it across the Tennessee River, they, to the, the um, um, what is it, Camp Contraband, the, uh, that they could um, they, they could be uh, protected by the Union Army, and there were at times between four and 8,000 people who made that journey. So, thinking about that, you know, you look at that river and it's really quite big, you know, it's wide. And wow, what a treacherous journey to take. You really have to want this freedom in order to do that, to leave what you know and to 
go somewhere else. And so it something went click. And I thought of the black spiritual deep river. How does it go? Deep river. My home is over Jordan. Deep river. I want to cross over into campground. So I was like, all right, now, <laughs> let's get to work. So I had, I had my juice, and I made 56 discs, and I, I, uh, I, I got someone to, a, a mezzo-soprano, to sing the song. And I, 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 got, I, I, I got some tapes uh, mixed. So I wanted, in this case, to have the singing coming from the air, you know? I didn't want it to be coming out of a radio or something like that. But, um, <clears throat> and, and, and I wanted the birds to be emanating from the suitcases because the suitcases represent like what your baggage is. What do you take with you when you move from one place to another? We all have baggage, whether it's emotional, physical, or uh, whatever. And these people wanted to, uh, they want it to be free. And so what do you take with you when you make a journey like that and leave what you know for an unknown place? Uh, I, I wanted the discs to... Uh, to, you know, the placement of the discs, it's in a spiral around the campground. So I, I, I had them all oriented in different ways to sort of give a feel of turmoil and, uh, you know, that plus the, the, the water and the, the wave sounds and... I also did the spiral because I was thinking about the Chattanooga Choo Choo, <laughs> <laughs> which, was, which was another thing that I had heard about before going there, and I was like, no way I'm doing anything about that. But um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a very re rewarding thing to allow myself to open up and feel the place and imagine and then have it all come together and to have the, the help and the support to get it done. Well, I think we're ready for some questions for the audience. Of course, I had many more questions I wanted to ask you, and I had a really good one. <laughs> well, if you tell me... I'm going to ask you one, one quick question and let you give me a quick answer, and then we'll turn it over. And you, you've touched on many of the things that I wanted to ask you, and one of them was just that this is a traveling exhibition with six stops. And, of course, you could have made, you know, a template and just left it to us to install it. Um, but instead, you've been very, that is not your way of operating. Um, and I just wanted you to talk a bit about what makes our installation unique and why, and why you're as involved as you are in it. This is the fourth venue for this traveling exhibition. And each museum has their own, uh, layout, floor plans, room sizes, rules, different kinds of lighting. Um, and so the Deep River, also, before this tour, Deep River also traveled to the Telfair Museum 
in Savannah and somewhere else, the Kummer Museum in uh, Jackson, Jacksonville, yeah, Jacksonville, Florida, Florida, yeah, and uh, I don't know if there were any other places, but each time it takes some adjustment to figure out how best to to uh, organize the space with Deep River and also with the other earlier sort of phases of my, my career, how to, um, you know, like, it, it, uh, how, how the viewers should encounter the works, what order should they be in, and what colors, the what wall colors will best uh, make the pieces pop. Every venue is different. Now I have to say that, and I'm, you know, I only say what I mean. This museum is the best venue. <laughs> 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 so I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> so you better appreciate it. No. <laughs> so I'd like to open up the floor to questions, and Haley will run around with the microphone. I think this was one Kevin back there. I saw, I saw one up here. Over here. Yep. I'm going by there. order of seeing yep. Hi. Thank you for coming to Cincinnati. What is... What is Conte, C-O-N-T-E, that I keep seeing? What is that? Conte. It is uh, uh, charcoal. It's a brand of charcoal, which is made in, in, in France. It's called Conte de Paris. The, um, the pigments that you know, most of your charcoal, like your, your, what do you call, compressed charcoal, is burnt wood that's then been compressed with, uh, and, and made into sticks. Conte has richer, darker pigments included in the recipe, and so, the, 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 the black that I'm able to get holds up against the activity of the wood grain. So therefore, I use mm, number 6B, Conte. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Thank you for coming to Cincinnati. Um, I haven't seen the show upstairs yet, but I've seen your work in other venues and other places. And I noticed most of the time your figures are posed or you simply, or I shouldn't say simply, or you just do a head study. Uh, is there a reason why you do not have the figures in any sort of action poses? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, I'm working from vintage photographs because that's what inspired me. Those hours I spent looking through my grandmother's photo albums gave me a real appreciation for, the, for that time period. And when um, uh, back in those, in, at that time period, uh, people went out and they got their photos taken by photo uh, photographers. And they usually dressed in a way that they were being presented the way they wanted to be seen. They, they made cabinet cards that were mounted on cardboard and they, they, they would mail them to their relatives that they hadn't seen for a long time. So, you know, you had to sit very still back then 
for a photograph. And so it's very rare to find images of people who are in action, who are walking or dancing or something like that, unless it's m a much more recent uh, photograph. I love the fact that these people went to immortalize themselves the way they wanted to be seen. And they, they, they wore what they wanted to wear. They collaborated with the photographer in, you know, this is, this is what I want and the photographer does his job, pose you or whatever. And um, I cannot think of uh, any of the pieces that I've done, like in my professional, oh no, no, sorry. Any, any of the pieces that I've done since, mm, since the prologue series. During the prologue series, I did a lot of dancers, you know, like uh, from old family photographs that my father took. Because he liked photographing at parties, and so dancing figures were, were really uh, fun to do. I worked for my father's photographs for a good seven or eight years. And then, as I said, I went to Georgia and I found this, this book and I felt freer because I didn't know the people and I didn't know narratives that I felt I had to adhere to. Uh, but I love the regality of the, you know, people sitting there in all their dignity uh, being photographed in those old photo shops, uh, phot photography shops. Now, I asked my grandmother. She passed away at 97. Her sister passed away at 99. Her sister's daughter is now going to be 101. So I get a lot of information from them about, you know, the family. And so I asked my grandmother, why did you all go to photo studios to get your photos taken? Did you do it because you had a, 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 a new outfit that you wanted to show off, or did you do it to send your image to friends and family, or did you do it to immortalize yourself for the future? And she said, I don't know, we just did it. <laughs> do you have any other questions? Yep, we have one. Well, I think two we can do. Yeah, we can maybe one. do two. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, it's, it's been really interesting. I love the charcoal on wood. I really love it. My question is a little bit more about you, I suppose. It's um, what enabled you to transition from a job and being able to doing your art to doing your art being your job? It is, that's a loaded topic. <laughs> <laughs> because it's actually very hard to immerse yourself in the art making process when there are so many uh, left brain things that you have to deal with, you know, like 
every, it's every year, it's like the, the holidays, and the next thing I know, I have to do taxes, you know? <laughs> 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 and then there's a birthday, and then there's another thing, and then, you know, I have to go to the doctor. There, there are just things that, but when I was teaching, I had a very hard time. I was teaching college, and I had a very hard time balancing the artistic me with the, the educator. And I know I was a good educator. I taught, as I said, from the time I was 27. The kids gave me a hard time at first. But as I got older, they started seeing me as a daddy figure, you know? And um, most of my work was done during the summers. And when we had a break in between, uh, like, the, the, the fall semester ends when it ends, and then it's the spring semester starts like a month later, I used to close myself in and just work because I had to. I had to seize that time, you know? It, for me, it's impossible to come home from teaching and s start making art. It's impossible for me to come home from a party and stop ma start making art. I have to I have to have a clear head. I have to have, you know, time to dream and let the ideas flow. A lot of the other things in life can uh, eat away at your your art art time. So I always tell young people that you have to protect your art. Protect your studio time. And, you know, then people will call you selfish until they see that you're doing something worthwhile. So I think we're going to wrap things up. But thank you so much for coming and for Whitfield. For <laughs>